Come on up, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get a foot right up here. <laughs> We're gonna gonna dedicate you two. Here's the documentation. Give that to Dad. Here's your personal Bibles. Who's Matthias? Matthias. Matthias, yeah. Paulo? You're welcome. Now, I'd like you to stretch out your hands. We dedicate young people to the Lord. It's not just, Lord, we're giving them to your hands for your promise and your purposes. We're dedicating ourselves afresh and anew to be an example to them, to love them and guide them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, they, kids talk. <laughs> Father, we just dedicate yes. and we declare that these young men are yours. Lord, they're yours. You have a plan for their life. Paulo and Mateus, Lord, you have a plan for them. Their father has brought them, Lord, and he's declaring, Lord, I want your plan over them. As Miguel comes, Lord, this morning, he's declaring, Lord God, that He's going to live for you. He's going to live his life to display Jesus Christ to these young men. And they're going to grow up in the plan that you have for them and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I thank you for this family. I thank you, Lord, that you're working in them and through them to accomplish your purpose. We rededicate ourselves, Lord God, as a church family to love them and support them to encourage them, and to lift them up always. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. <laughs> I love you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many have uh, heard or read Paul Harvey's uh, the price they had to pay the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. So if you're interested, here it is. I copied off 30 copies. And, uh, you know, just the fact that when they signed their name on the Declaration of Independence, that was their death sentence. That was, that was treason. And they signed it openly, and John Hancock signed it very big, and he says so that <coughs> King George couldn't miss it. <laughs> But uh, if you're interested, here they are. It tells you what happened to each one of them. A number of them died during the thing. A number of them went bankrupt, giving everything. And uh, I think it's important as we are Christians that we stand in the blessings of what we've given from other people. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns it. It's a reproach. It's a disgrace. It ruins it to any people. I want to come off it from this way. Luke 6, 47, 48. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he starts out with, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teachings, that means receives them, and then follows them. That person is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like the person who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the storm beat vehemently, and ultimately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. I want to tell you, I believe very strongly, and we're going to see it this morning, that our nation was founded on Jesus Christ and the Word of God. It was founded by men and women who were believers. By the way, it wasn't just men, and, there were women. You need to look behind Adams and find Abigail Adams, whose dad was a minister who influenced much of the writings of not only her husband, but of her son as a Christian lady. John Adams would send Abigail Adams much of what he was going to talk about 
to have it checked out. What do you think about that? I probably should, smart man, I should probably give my sermons to Patty and she can... <laughs> Loved ones, this is true for our nation and it's true for you and I. As we build our lives on the foundation of truth, God's word and his promises, as we're being followers of Jesus Christ, but being followers of Jesus Christ, you know what it doesn't exempt us from? Storms of life. You know, I, I remember back in the 70s, oh, try Jesus, everything will be fine. Try Jesus, things are going to get crazy. When you commit to Jesus Christ, Satan's going to come at you with everything he's got. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. When Jesus said, you, you come to me, you accept me. I'm not a candy bar you just try. Oh, that didn't work. I didn't like that one. I like them. Enjoy better. You know, no. When you commit your life to Jesus Christ, you're going to get some flack from the enemy. But that's okay. Because Jesus is in you and he's with you. We do not exempt as followers of Jesus Christ. We're not exempt from the floods of circumstances, the streams of opposition, the wild winds of the wilds, the depraved imps of hell. What being a follower of Jesus Christ did for us is give us assurance that our foundation in Jesus Christ cannot be shaken. Greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. As we, loved ones, continue to stay centered in Jesus, his words obedient to his whisper as well as his word, and pray, we as a people and we as a nation will weather the storms of the demonic. Those who listen to my teaching, when they come to me, listen to my teaching, they're obedient to it, and then they continue in it. I believe there's a large group of people in America who are still founded on the rock, and I don't think we're going anyplace. We may go someplace, hey, look, look, <laughs> look, if we're going to get raptured, I'm fine. I, I don't have any problem with that. I got student loan that they're not going to forgive now. <laughs> and I got to keep paying on it. <laughs> we won't stop about that. America is over. Doom, gloom, hopelessness screeches. It screeches at us from both the media on the left and the media on the right. And to both, I tell you, shut up. God is greater than your doom and your gloom and your screeching, which drive me crazy. Well, I was already there. It just... Short walk, yeah. That's going to be a tough morning. I can see that right now. I want to tell you something. If we are in Christ, committed to Christ, following and obedient... Our lives are built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And I believe as we do what God has called us to do, as we pray, as we stand up, don't back up. You ever notice that the, the armor of God in Ephesians has no back protection? It's only for going forward. We need to have each other's back. We will not be shaken, and our, and our foundation as a nation and our lives that are founded on Jesus Christ, his word, his promises, it will hold. Amen? Amen. Number one, first point. Our nation's foundation is a Christian nation, founded in God's word, birth, and relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. A lot of the people who try to rewrite history don't understand that words have different meanings as they go. If you read, uh, new, uh, you read a King James version of the Bible at the end of Acts, uh, one of the old versions of King James, there's been like 13 of them recently, the old version says that Paul picked up his carriage and walked. Man, he was a strong guy. Well, that word carriage means baggage or luggage, if you read it in the modern thing. When we read the founding fathers and, the, and, and those influencing the birth of this nation, we understand that they used religion instead of Christianity. 98%, according to the study, I'm going to read you the study in a minute, 
of people in the new colonies, the new United States, considered themselves Christians. 98%. There's a couple thousand Jews that were in, in a synagogue. Our nation's foundations is a Christian nation founded in God's word, birthed in a relationship with Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say I am an American Christian. Or I'm a Christian. Oh, that's nationalism. <laughs> Too bad. You're not going to back me into a corner. I'm not a globalist. I believe God has charged. God put his hand and his stamp on this nation of blessings. And it's time the church stand up and say, hey, we believe God put us here for a reason. We have and are the world's largest distributor of missionaries and missions. You will never see, well, you had never seen, a hospital started by other religions because that's Allah's will. They die, they die. Same with Buddhist. You die, you die. Christianity is the one that understood because of Christ's compassion and caring and outreach. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people is chosen for his own inheritance. Psalms 33, 12. Our very nation's motto is, in God we trust. When we look at the scriptural faith or biblical heritage, we see that the faith of our nation's founding fathers, mothers, matters in reference to our immediate faith and the understanding of who God is to this nation and to us who trust in him today. By the way, this isn't a perfect nation. You might turn to somebody and say, you're not perfect either. We are committed to living and loving in Jesus Christ. Yeah, we made, and we still make lots of mistakes. But we need to understand that this nation was birthed, all three forms of the government, our laws are birthed out of Scripture. Now, if you were here for the 16-week study, two eight-week studies on the foundation and our founding fathers, um, you would have gotten some of it. I'll read back to you. If you are interested, somewhere we have all the copies. It cannot be emphasized too greatly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only person to have been elected five times as governor of the same state in our history. The person who stood up and said, give me liberty or give me death. The person who said, if I leave my children nothing but salvation through Jesus Christ, I leave them wealthy. By the way, the rest of that saying is, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's for this very, re this very reason peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. That finishes that. The reason there's other people able to worship here is because we're not going to force you to accept Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that draws you to Christ. Not government, not rules, not anything else. Other nations, you may be killed. But Patrick Henry saw it clear. And it's for this very reason, that because we're founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that other faiths have been afforded asylum. And well, it should be. We're not a theocracy. We're a republic, a represented democracy, founded on the Word of God. It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and to humbly implore His protection and favor. George Washington. Probably no president spoke more about Jesus Christ providence and God than George Washington. You realize George Washington preached sermons. 
if you read the, the book on his life, you, you'll understand that the lies that are told about him are lies. He was a believer in Jesus Christ. Do you realize that every single day of his life as an adult, he got up and he first went to pray? That's what he did every day in his journal. You'll find it. Rewriting of history is a dangerous thing because we lose Jesus Christ in American history when we write it. We need to understand that the basis, the fundamental basis of this nation's law was given to Moses on the mount. The fundamental basis of our Bill of Rights comes from the teachings which we get from Exodus and St. Matthew and from Isaiah and St. Paul. Now, that's not a president that was one of the founding fathers. That man was a president when I was born. That tells you how old I am. Right there with Moses on the mount. The Supreme Court of the United States has declared three times through the judicial decree the United States of America is a Christian nation. Three times it's gone to the... Supreme Court. Three times the Supreme Court has said it. I'm, I'm going to read you just a few things from the paper. I don't want to... I, I hope you understand and are able to confront those who declare that the United States is not a Christian nation. We are founded on the foundation and the rock of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that and we need to stand for that. Most of you know the story of when we were writing the Constitution. They were in Philadelphia. And, and it was just, they were at an impasse. And, and many were getting ready to go home. They were just, they were so frustrated with each other. These are all strong-minded men. All have their own views and opinions. And one gentleman stands up. And he asked to address the Congress as people were getting ready to go just leave and let it die. I have lived, sirs, a long time. And the longer that I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire cannot rise without his aid. How can we be assured, sir? We, can be, we have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. I firmly believe this. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings are on our deliberations, deliberations be held in this assembly Every morning before we proceed to business and that one or more of the clergy of this city be requested to officiate in that service. Now, if I'm, before I tell you his name, some of you already know. Some of you, oh, no, he couldn't have said that. Yeah, he's the one who saved us from, and helped us get a constitution. Oh, he's a deist. Oh, no, he's not. He's a firm believer in Jesus Christ. Here's the reality, folks. Just because they didn't act. Wow, oh, I don't want anyone to use that word. They didn't act like they should have acted all the time. Didn't mean they didn't believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. By the way, that was Benjamin Franklin. Here's this one. This comes from uh, David Dale and Jews, Judaism, and the American founding. The founders identified themselves as Christians. In 1776, every colonist, with the exception of about 2,000 Jews, identified them himself or herself as a Christian. 98% of them were Protestant, the remaining two were Roman Catholic. Um, oh, boy. No. John Quincy Adams, by the way, John Quincy Adams had this checked out by his mother before he wrote it. From the, that's Abigail Adams. From the day of declaration, they, the American people, have been bound by the laws of God 
which they all, and by the laws of the gospel, which they nearly all acknowledge as rules for their conduct. I have a number of other, but let's get this straight. The foundation of this nation is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and his word. That's not going to be shaken. Okay, yeah, we got bad leaders. We got people that are doing really, really unbiblical stuff. But our God will not be shaken. We need to understand as we pray and as we stand up and do what we're called to do as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and citizens of not only heaven, but citizens here on earth, it'll stand and so shall we. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Loved ones, it is our duty as Americans to pray for our nation and to live lives that exalt our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Two, point. Our personal lives, our foundation affects our nation. Again, it's talking about the fact in Luke where, hey, how are you going to live? Are you going to follow it out? Are we going to say we're a Christians and then acquiesce to all the other stuff? No. Jesus says as we live it out, we need to live it out. I will show you what it's like for someone comes to me, when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. That person is like the person building a house who dug deep on the foundation of the rock. They continue to follow it. Folks, as we continue to love the Lord and love people in Jesus Christ, it's going to show. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Being a Christian and setting an example is more than just praying. It's living a life that others can see that displays and gives glory to God. Two, Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared hand beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen? God's got stuff for us to do, folks. Don't sit back. Stand up and love Jesus and love people to life in Jesus Christ. One of the very, I think it was the third sermon I preached at Southside, I gave everybody one of these, and I'll bet none of them have them anymore. Anybody know what this is? Nail, all right. It's horseshoe nail. Every one of us, every one of us are responsible for what God's called us to do. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of the shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of the horse, the rider was lost. For the want of the rider, the battle was lost. For the want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. All for the want of a horseshoe nail. Benjamin Franklin. God has created us individually. He has called us. He's gifted us. And every one of us need to be responsible to live the life that God has called. Well, other people can do it. No, 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 no. For the want of a nail, that one person. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should accomplish them, walk in them. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what we're supposed to be about. Loving people to life in Jesus Christ. Standing and standing firm. You don't have to argue with them. You really don't. You don't have to stand and two little... Chihuahuas. And if you have a Chihuahuas, I apologize. No, I don't. What are you doing having a Chihuahua? <laughs> it is as each one of us do our part, the part assigned to us by God, staying in right relationship with Jesus, obedient to his word and his whisper, that our individual lives and thus our nation will weather the storms of this demonic schemes and we will come out victorious through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now here's the deal. Am I saying prophetically? No, I'm just saying this is what the Word of God says. I don't claim to be a prophet or the son of a prophet. I claim to be a person who reads the Word of God. And I see what's going about me. And I said, Lord, this is your Word. 
Your word is truth. Our lives will stand, and as we stand, our nation will stand, for God is our foundation. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teach, and then follows it. It's like the person building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on the rock. And when the floods rose, the stream beat vehemently against the house, it couldn't shake it, for it was founded on the rock. As we as believers in Jesus Christ stand on the rock and live on the life that he's called us to live, exampling, that's probably not a word, is it? Okay, put it in your dictionary. Yeah, it's a word. Okay, good. Live the example that draws others to Christ. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That's us, folks. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping Him with a holy fear and awe. Worshiping Him includes how we live our lives. Living our lives is worship unto God as we live it rightly. Amen? Loved ones, our standing, our living on the solid rock assures us we shall weather the storm and so shall our nation as we pray and live the lives that God has ordained for us. We would not have survived this long if God were not our foundation and His blessing was not on this nation. I want to encourage you. Speak life to people about America. Speak life to about the life that you live in Jesus Christ. Speak love. The devil's got enough negativity and screeching running around there. We don't need to add to that. What we need to add to is hope and life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This nation is far from over. It's far from over. There are millions yet to hear the gospel. And this nation sends more missionaries than any other nation. And by the way, there's people right around you. I don't mean right in this church but living near you who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was stunned the first time I found somebody who had never heard. But you're in America. You sing Christmas carols? No. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, God bless America. And Lord, we want to bless you. We want to live a life that glorifies you. Forgive us for the things, Lord, that we, that as a nation we do. And like, like Jeremiah, like, Lord, we stand and just, we, we stand in that place and say, forgive us. And Lord, give us the strength, the words, and the ability through your Holy Spirit to stand and change some of these laws. We come in prayer first, but Lord, you call us to at times get up off our knees and follow your directions and how to bring our nation back online to you. So, Father, I thank you, and I, I literally say, God bless America. And, Lord, let us be blessed as we follow you in all that we do in loving people to life in Jesus Christ. Amen? For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. One of the things we need to understand is that Paul was not at the Last Supper. Often we get think, well, he was there. No, he wasn't. Paul spent time in the desert with Jesus. Jesus spoke to him. He showed him what was going on. It's quite an amazing thing when Paul writes this. That which I deliver to you, I receive from the Lord. That on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The promises of healing are ours. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. I've read a number of, not a number, I've read a few 
articles and books, they forgot to put new. It's a new covenant. It's a new covenant. We get back to the same relationship that Adam and Eve had when Jesus expired, when he died on the cross. The three-foot temple curtain was torn in half from the top to the bottom. New covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This is what communion is all about. It's very solemn, but it's not depressing. Because we have a new covenant. We have the ability to be healed through Jesus Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. Activate it. The word means activate it. So as you take the bread this morning, Lord, if there's somebody that needs healing, Lord, we just apply that. Body, soul, mental, whatever. Lord, I thank you that you're the healer. You're the healer. And we're going to activate that by thanking you for that healing for that person. When you take this, you thank the Lord. That it's activated. Jesus said, activate it. Do this in remembrance of me. Put it into effect. Pray in surety. Praise in thanksgiving. Anoint in confidence. Stand and proclaim. Receive what is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? And he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we hold the bread, the semblance of your broken body. And Lord, we thank you that you, before there was time, loved us so much. You knew what it cost you. And you did it for us. To bring us hope and to bring us healing. So Father, we hold the bread and we, we activate the promises that have come through your broken body. Hallelujah. Our God, our healer. And we, Lord, make them applicable to that person that we're thinking of that needs your touch this morning. Please eat. And in the same manner, He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Father, I thank you. Lord, I'm so thankful for immediate forgiveness. I thank you, Lord, that guilt and shame even self-incrimination, Lord, is taken away through the blood of Jesus Christ. We can come boldly before the throne to receive mercy and grace. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that convicts us. And I thank you, Lord, that we can instantly be forgiven as we walk in forgiveness. We do this in remembrance of you. Amen.